We are now recording. Um, I'm Jenny Dale. You all know these things. Um, ULVLC lives on. And this is our first session in June. So I'm very excited that Brown agreed to do a session on Python, um, which had a lot of interest. Um, I'm going to let him talk a little bit more about where we'll go from here. Um, because as you all know, you had the option to select multiple things whenever you um, signed up for the session, like multiple different options. Um, so I'm going to let Brown talk about that. I will be monitoring the chat, but we are a small enough group that I do think um, you could potentially just unmute yourself if you have a question as Brown's going. Is that okay with you, Brown? Uh, yes, that's fine with me, yes. All right, so I think that'll also work, um, but you can also use the chat. I'll be keeping a close eye on that as well. So with all that said, I'm turning it over to Brown. All right, thank you all for being here today. I do want to take a moment, since with the audience and recording, to say something. To those of you watching this both live and a recording, I feel it is necessary to take a brief moment to comment on the atrocities and savagery committed upon Black Americans for centuries. No one should live in constant fear of the legal systems and authorities of their country based solely upon their skin color. No one should be afraid to walk downstairs, let alone outside because of how brown they be, may be. And no one should lie awake at night wondering if a loved one will be mistaken for someone else, potentially with lethal consequences with no under, other similarity than skin tone. To say that I am stunned shows my lack of awareness of how matters have been for far too long. So, uh, to begin, we're going to be talking about um, Python, uh, trying to get an introductory uh, experience with it. Uh, and we're going to be working with a distribution called Anaconda, uh, which I hope that many of you have downloaded and installed. Um, if so, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, moving on towards opening it up where we need to be for this particular segment. Uh, what I'm, we're looking for is under Anaconda, the Anaconda Navigator. Um, and when you open it up, some things will pop up and run. There'll be this green circle. And then you'll get a screen that shows a number of the applications that are part of the Anaconda suite. And you'll see there's a bunch of things here. I know uh, folks have used R, for example. Um, I don't know much about R. I would I would defer to Joe if Joe were willing to perhaps introduce us to some of that. But the thing we are going to be working with today is Python inside of a, an environment called Jupyter. And Jupyter, I believe, J-U-P-Y-T-E-R, um, is kind of an amalgam of the names uh, Julia, which is, I believe, a, uh, a statistics analysis program, uh, Python, and R. And so from what I understand, you can run uh, those programs inside of a notebook and we're going to be using that to run Python today. So when you get to this screen, you've opened up the Anaconda Navigator, there'll be something here. This is the one we're going to look for, the Jupyter Notebook, and we're going to click Launch. When we do this, it starts running some things and then it opens it up in a browser with a kind of a home screen here. And this home screen is what you should see here are the files in your user folder. If you're in Windows or you're on Mac, the, your default user folder. So if you'll look here, this is my user folder on my computer. And you can see that the names for these folders are the same. And this allows you to do some of the same type of uh, folder organization that you would inside of that um, folder. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to go ahead and create a folder for what we're working with today. So I'm going to go over here to new and folder. And you'll see it creates an untitled folder here, which we'll see it just did right now. And I'm going to click on this little checkbox and rename. I'm going to call this Python Playground, because that's what I'm kind of naming these uh, sessions. Hopefully it'll stick. And you'll see it created and renamed this folder Python Playground. If I click on this, it'll open that window 
And of course, there's nothing in this folder since we just created it. And I'm going to create a new Python 3 notebook. Now at this point, we should have Jupyter running. We should have a folder called Python um, Playground, and we should have a blank, untitled notebook up and running. In this here, we have a cell with a blinking cursor here. It's in green, that's important, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and a bunch of menu commands associated with interacting with our code. When this is green, we are in edit mode. We are editing the content of the green cell. If we click outside of it or we hit escape on the keyboard, it turns blue and this is the command mode. This means that we are about to run the code in this cell. Hey Brown, sorry to interrupt, yes. but could you take a quick step back? I had trouble trying to get my folder renamed. Sure. Um, can you take two steps back? I'm sorry. No, that's fine. So we're here. If this right here, if you click on this checkbox, there's a rename function. Okay, I, I didn't see the checkbox. That was my okay. issue. That's fine. And thank you for speaking up. I'm more than happy to answer questions as they come up. Okay, so you renamed it, what, Playground? Yeah. The, the main thing that I wanted to illustrate is that we have this folder here, and then this is where our notebooks are going to be. Okay. Sound good? Yeah, so I made the folder, it says Playground now, sorry, you can pick up again from there. Mm -hmm. So then I clicked on Python Playground and I create a new Python 3 notebook. And when you do that, it will automatically open this up. Now, the uh, show of hands are, are, is everybody at this stage now? All right, Callie, everybody. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Thank you so very much. All right. So we have this cell here and we are going to, right now, we are going to type some code into it. So what I would like for you to do is as we're going to type, I'm going to type kind of slowly because I want you to watch what happens. I'm going to type P-R-I-N. And as soon as I type T, it turns green. And what that's letting us know is that print is a command that Jupyter Notebook recognizes in Python. And so we're going to see a lot of code coloring for things when they start, uh, when Jupyter um, recognizes what they are. Another thing that uh, Jupyter does that's really nice is whenever you uh, type a character that is usually in a pair, like a parentheses or quotes or square brackets or curly braces, when you type one, it automatically puts the pair to it and puts the cursor in between. So print, and then we're gonna put the parentheses here. Similarly, we're going to put a double quotes. It turns those red, and those are inside of the parentheses. Now, a common introductory activity when you're doing programming is the hello world statement. And I'm just going to type that now. And if I go up here and click run, it has taken what I've typed here and printed it out. Now, I'm going to take a moment here for an important kind of philosophical statement. Um, if you're at this point and you've done this, and you walk away from your computer right now and never ever look at Python again, you have written a program and no one can ever take that from you and no one can ever say that you're less of a programmer than they are because it's all about you have written a program and there's more for you to learn. And that is what you share with every single computer programmer the worldwide. So we've written a program, we've executed it, and a couple of things have happened as soon as we ran that cell. First off, it printed the output from the print command. It surrounded the cell in blue. Remember we said that's command mode. 
and it created another cell below it. Another important thing is over to the side where it says in, there's a numeral one. And that's telling us that this code inside of this cell has been run. If there's some sort of number there, that tells us the order in which the code has been run. If there's an asterisk in there, usually that means something is running or you might have gotten an error. So let's talk about what is inside of the cell. We have said that print is a command and commands usually have the, print, the set of parentheses after them to indicate what the command is going to kind of take in, what it's going to process. And the things, sometimes there's more than one, that are inside these parentheses are called arguments. This print command, we have passed a single argument, and that is the statement, hello world. And that part in red is called a string. Now, when you're doing programming, you will hear of things called data types. And the first data type we're gonna talk about is a string. A string is just some group of characters, whether or not they are letters or numbers or punctuation or so on. A string is just a bunch of characters. If we put numbers into a string, we want them, in a sense, we want them to be read, but we don't necessarily do math on them. If we want to do math with um, data, we use a different type of uh, uh, data type. Um, there are two different ones that you commonly use, there are more, but we're gonna focus on these two right now. And one is an integer. Integers are whole numbers, negative and positive, and zero. We're familiar with these, and we use these for math and making sure things are ordered or if we need to add to them to say, uh, be able to check and see how many times something has happened. We can do math operations with numbers. And if I run this here, it will add them together. I can uh, multiply them using the asterisk. Now, a couple of things that I've just done. One, I've run a cell a second time. Notice that this now has a three after it. It's because I have been running them and each time I run a cell, it increases one of these numbers by one. So we always have an order that we're know knowing what's going on. If I go back over here and run this one, Notice it says four here. That tells me that this cell was run or executed after this one was. So if I'm ever making changes further down and it's not seeing what I'm looking for, maybe I made a change more recently to something somewhere else and it's good to look at the numbers. The other thing it did is when we said the print command, it just printed it. But when I did a math operation without a print command, it showed me that there was output and the numbers correspond. So now we know we have input, which is this operation here, and the output is the math that comes from it. So we've got integers, we're multiplying them together. There is something called a float. A float is very similar to an integer, but it can have a decimal in it. If I run this one, it does the math for us. Notice there's a rounding error here. We won't, we won't really worry about that right now. Um, and so we have integers and floats and sometimes we will get a float from an operation that involves integers. A way to check and see what our data type is, is to use the type command. And if I run this, it's telling me it's an integer. If I run this one, it says it's a float. And if I do this,
we just want, want to spell it right, this is a string. The last data type that I want to talk about is called a Boolean. Now, those of you who teach classes that involve um, online searches, we know about Boolean search and an or and things like that. A Boolean variable is just true or false. And when we're indicating a variable in Python, it is um, a capital T for true, capital F for false. And do you see how the color changed as soon as I completed the word? Let me make this a little bit bigger, by the way, just so everybody can see what I'm typing. We can get a Boolean by doing comparisons, for example, is one less than five? If we run this, it says that is true. Is one greater than five? That is false. We can say is five greater than five? That is false. It's five greater than or equal to five? That is true. So we've dealt with strings, integers, floats, and Booleans. Now with those four data types, we can do all sorts of fascinating things. So let's talk about supplying output to the screen. So let's do, say, print, I have two cats. Now here we have a string because of the double quotes around everything and the numeral two is in the middle of it. Now because the two is in between some uh, quotation marks, this is a character inside of a string. And so it would be difficult for us to do math with this now. So what I'm going to do instead is I am going to add something called a variable. Now inside of a cell, so far we've done single line um, code. We can actually do multiple lines, just like in say Microsoft Word, if you just hit enter, you're adding a new row, excuse me, a new line. I am going to type number equals three. Number here is a variable. A variable is kind of like a bucket where you put things. Um, in this case, I'm putting the number three into this bucket. And what I can do with number here is I can now put this into my print statement. And it'll go something like this. If I put number in here, Python isn't smart enough to know that I'm talking about number of the variable. And if I just execute this lot, these lines, it just takes the word number. It assumes that I want the string the way it is. What I can do is I can put curly braces around it. Now notice what I just did. I selected some text and then I pressed the left curly brace. What this did was it knew that it wanted, it knew that I wanted to surround what I had selected with a character that is usually associated in pairs. And it automatically included that. And I'll be able to do that in other places with parentheses or quotes or square brackets and things like that. Um, it's always nice to be able to do that. So to kind of as a shortcut, if you're going to have the paired symbols, it's neat to be able to select some text and then just press the left one and it will surround them. So if I run this now, it still sees these curly braces as um, text as part of our string. So I'm going to change one thing right here and I'm gonna put the letter F outside of my quotes. When I do that, Python version three or greater knows that it's going to look inside of a string for something in curly braces and evaluate that as a variable. 
Watch what happens when I add the F. Do you see how it changed the color of the word number and the curly braces to black? When I run this cell now, it goes back, it looks for the variable number, evaluates it for what it says it's in there, and then puts that into the string and then prints it. Now, why is this helpful? We could, it's just as easy to type three, right? Well, this is where programming really starts to show what it's capable of. What we want to do is we want to minimize the amount of things that we have to do by hand and then put them onto the computer to do. So in this one right here, I have number cats. I'm gonna make a little bit longer sentence. My mom says that I should not, I should not have more than number plus two cats. If I run this, what we've done here is we've referred to this variable and done some math on it all within the same line. And because we've used the variable in multiple places, if we change the variable, say we now have five cats and run it, it changes it in multiple places. So if you have a situation where you have data that needs to be represented consistently or with a consistent operation in multiple locations, if you assign that data to a variable and then put the variable in various locations, you only have to change the data once. We could go even so further to say things like, just so she's not suspicious, I hide number minus two cats in the guest bedroom when she comes over. And I'll run that. I have five cats. My mom says that I should not have more than seven cats just so she's not suspicious. I hide three cats in the guest bedroom when she comes over. So I've used this variable three times and I've done math operations on each of them, but I've only changed the value once. What if I change it to something like 12? Then this story gets really crazy. I have 12 cats. My mom says that I should not have more than 14 cats just so she's not suspicious. I hide 10 cats in the guest bedroom when she comes over. So, are we going to be writing prose about the number of cats that we have? Well, maybe, I don't know. But one of the, th one of the things, thank you, Jenny <laughs> and Sean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, alert. You know, I don't want to invite people over if I'm allergic um, to cats. Um, but where we can do things like this is if we have values that we're pulling from, say, a spreadsheet or a report, and we are then formatting that so it's human readable, we could assign those values to this. What if it was the text instead of, I'm gonna make a new line here. Um, let's say books equals 35. And then we have a statement that is print. There are books in the ABC collection. Remember to put our F in front of it, so it formats that as a variable. I need to probably actually say books. And what we've done here is we can now take data, numeric data, and process it in, as an input and then put that into a formatted string and then generate text based upon that value. Now, just because I'm assigning numbers here, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be numbers. This is something that Python does that some people think is really powerful and other people are really frustrated by. Right now, books is an integer because we've assigned an integer value to it. But what if I said this here? Well, this works too. Because now books is a string. So this speaks to the ability of variables to change their type kind of dynamically. Uh, people who program in Java run into a problem here because we it, once we called a variable one type, we couldn't then assign the other type of data to it. Now, we would normally keep this a, an integer, for example, if we wanted to do math on it, or we wanted to do some sort of comparisons operations. And so the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about conditional logic. Conditional logic and conditional operations work like this. We say if, notice that it turns green, we have some sort of operation that will give a Boolean, either true or false. Say, for example, we're talking about the number of books again. If books is greater than 10, I hit a colon and then I hit enter. It automatically indents the line to show that this is what we're going to do if this part before the colon is true. Print. Now, right now we've assigned books to 15. If books is greater than 10, print our collection is growing. And it does that. Why does it do that? Because it looks at the variable books which is equal to 15 here. And it checks, is 15, the value in books, greater than 10? If so, say this. What do we want to do if maybe that condition is not true? Well, in that case, we do an else statement. If I run this cell again, it only prints this first part, this first part because this evaluated to true. Notice that I have 29 here and I have 27 here. I ran this statement before this one. If I change this to say five, and run it, now this is 30. This has been run after this one was. So if this is dependent upon the changes here, this will not reflect what is going on here, right? There are now five in the books variable. And if I run this, we need to get some more books. Again, it's looked at the books variable, oops, sorry. It's looked at the books variable checked to see that the numeral integer five is in it, five is less than 10, and it says this is false, it skips this line and goes straight on to this one. We don't have to do um, integers. Again, we can compare floats to integers because they're both numbers. We can't, however, do a string If I run this one and then run here, I'm going to get an error because a greater uh, than sign is not supported between um, instances of string and integer. Yes, Sean makes an excellent point. Um, and thank you for mentioning that, Sean. I should have mentioned that earlier. Python is a case sensitive programming language. And what 
he's talking about here is if he changes this to a capital B books, books is not defined. Look, there's a lowercase b here and an uppercase b here. If I change this back to lowercase, it works again. I'm gonna change this back to a numeral. Yeah, it's, and what's weird, Jenny, is that there's some programming languages that are very forgiving about it, and there are others that are not, and sometimes it's not immediately apparent when it's an issue and when it isn't. I keep getting that error, even though I changed books back to a number. Did you run the cell again? Error on the side of consistency. Yeah, that is a very good point, Jenny. All right, Patrick, can we try? Weird, let me keep trying. Okay, please let me know if that continues. Because the next step that we want to do we want to start doing some more um, processing and some other operations that are involved that involve numbers. That would be fine too. Patrick, would you like to share your screen? Okay. Let's see. New share. Oops. I'm going to uh, stop share for now. So Patrick, I think that you can now, but if you can't, let me know because there is another. Uh, oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. But, okay. I'll tell you right now. Do you see how you have 15 in quotes? 15 in quotes is a string. Does everybody see what's going on here where there is a uh, 15 is in quotation marks? All right, now let's try it again. There it is. Okay. So Patrick uh, shows a very interesting point and I'm going to go ahead and go back to sharing my screen again. Let's see sharing screen this one. Thank you for that Patrick. All right. Can everybody see my uh, uh, screen again should be sharing. Um, so yes, anything in quotations is a string, right? If I select this and look at the type, it is a string. If I say two, three, four, five, six plus two, it's, it's confused about what I want to accomplish here because it looks at this no different than it would look at the word pancake or Cairo. But if I remove the quotes and run it, it does the math on it. Now here's where it gets kind of weird. If I put quotes around this and quotes around the two, watch what it does. It assumes that we have two different strings right next to it together and we just want to mash them together. This works when you want to do things like say peanut and butter, right? It concatenates them together. If the plus sign is used with two strings, you're concatenating. If the plus sign is used with two numbers, you're adding. So the difference is like this, three plus four is the string 34. Three without three quotes plus four with quotes is seven. Just something to be mindful of when we're talking about strings and numbers and stuff like that. So what Patrick encountered, it is definitely something that uh, a lot of people encountered and you'll see this happen a lot uh, especially when you're formatting strings and passing them so that they're visible. And when I say passing, forgive me for using jargon, what I, that means is 
when we take something and give it to something else, when I take a variable and give it to something else, I am passing it like a football or um, a Frisbee or something like that. I am taking a thing and I'm giving it to something else. In this case, I am taking the string, because of quotes, two, three, four, five, six, and passing it to the type command. I am giving this string to the type command for the type command to do something with it. So when I say passing, my apologies, that is some jargon. All right, so we've, to go back through what we've talked about here, we've used the print statement to print strings. We've done some math with integers and floats. We've gotten the type of things We're using the type command. We've done comparisons, which have allowed us to do, um, to return Booleans. Again, return, another jargon word, is when you do an operation, whatever comes out of it, you are returning a result. Um, and we've done some math with variables inside of a string, right? We've done some, uh, variables inside of strings and seeing that we can do this with integers and strings. We've seen what happens when we call a number a string with quotations and we've evaluated the truth of a statement and made a decision using an if then else statement. So let's start putting some of these things together and working with them in such a way that we can do um, some, let's see, analysis on things. So we've got a books variable that we've assigned a value to it, right? And we're doing a print, our collection is growing, we need to get some more books. So let's do a couple of variables. I'm going to say capacity, Okay, and I'm just gonna pick an arbitrary value here. Capacity is 30. We've got books up here, but I'm going to add, I'm gonna type books again down here. Now, when I run this cell, this one is 47 and this one is 38. Whichever has the higher number wins. And so that's another thing to be mindful of when we start making changes to code. I can reassign a value to this variable, but if I look at books, whichever one was run last wins out. So I'm going to go back to this cell. I'm gonna hit enter and I'm going to say, if books is greater than or equal to capacity, print, we are at capacity, thank you very much. Okay, so we have this, we have two variables here, one that gives us a capacity statement and one that is telling us how many we actually have on site. And if we run this, it tells us we only have four books right now. We'd love some more. What if our, the number of books that we have is 35? We are at capacity, thank you very much. What if we expand our capacity and we now have more space for them? We only have 35 books right now. We'd love some more. 
So this is allowing us to take data and put it in two different places and compare it. What if we wanted to show some more information um, about this? Right here it says we only have books, books right now. We'd love some more. We could also say like this, we are at books divided by capacity. Watch this. So that's giving us a decimal, right? I think we want to make it formatted correctly. I'm going to say books times 100 capacity percent capacity. And if I run that one, so we are taking two variables that are integers. We're comparing them and we have a, we are actually able to do a math operation inside of the statement there. Yes, Sean makes a good point. I noticed that where you indent else matters, it needs to be aligned left. Exactly. There is space here. This indicates that this is to run inside of this colon here. Um, this one in indicates this is to run inside this colon here. I can put a second line if it's indented. See, it still ignores this line because books is not greater than capacity. If I change this to 41, say for example, it does both of these because they're indented. If I delete the indent, I'm going to get an error because this is not indented here, right? If I take this out by cut, say for example, and put this after the else statement, but I don't indent it, it's going to print that no matter what we do. So the indentation shows where the statements are associated with the conditions and whether or not they're going to be evaluated or jumped over. Is this making sense to everybody? Is this sounding good? Any questions so far? Are we having fun? I hope so. Good, excellent, fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So just take a moment right now. If you have gotten this far, you've dealt with data types, you've de dealt with comparisons, You've dealt with logic. You have formatted messages based upon data. And what's cool about this is, and this is what I love about programming, I'm lazy. How painful is it to, would it be to write this sentence however many times you have collections? What if you could write this in one place and then whenever these variables change and, uh, change the values in the text. Sean makes a very good, um, asks a very good question. And I think now might be a good time for us to pause since this is a lot of stuff to understand and talk about some of the shortcuts with the cells that we have and a couple of the things that we can do. So yes, is there any way to move lines up and down like grab and move up in the command list? There is. I'm in this mode here. It is in green, right? And these arrows allow me to move the blocks up and down, right? It turns blue because I'm in command. I'm now in command mode, but I can move these around. Now, keep in mind that remember how we assigned the value of books, the variable here, and then we moved it up here. If you were to run all the cells, like here, it presumes that you're starting at the top and going all the way down to the bottom. Any place where you would have a value set, like to the books variable, and it changes, it's going to change in sequential order. 
So we have a bunch of these cells here, and there are a lot of these commands and operations that we have. We've been running. This allows you to move cells up and down. So I'm going to talk about some shortcuts that you can use. So uh, let's say, for example, you have a cell here that you don't want anymore. You can delete cells or you can press the D, if it's in um, command mode, the blue, press the D key twice, so one, two. That deletes a cell. If you want to add a cell above the current cell you're working on, A for above, and if you want to add a cell below, that's B for below. If you want to run a cell, you can click run up here. You can also hit shift enter. If you run shift enter, it runs the contents of a cell and then moves you to the next cell. If there isn't a next cell, it will automatically add one. If you want to run a cell and stay there, you hit control enter. So those shortcuts are some of the things that you can do to run code very easily. Now, we've been working using these things here inside of Jupyter Notebook. A question that people ask is, yes, this is, this is great that you're messing with this stuff inside of the Jupyter Notebook. That's inside of a web browser. But what if I just want to type the code in Python? Well, there is inside of Anaconda an Anaconda prompt. And if you type Python, you'll run a command here and you get these three little arrows and it's just the same as before. An index of commands for uh, Jupyter. Yes, here's a sh keyboard shortcuts inside of Jupyter right here. If you click, go to help keyboard shortcuts Notebook no, help. I meant, I meant um, like the commands like print or type or um, when you're doing comparisons. Like, are there, is there a, an index or dictionary of that type of command? So I, I, I'm sad to say you're probably not going to like my answer because, <laughs> because the answer is yes and it is encyclopedic. Um, the python.org, I believe, um, and you go to documentation, I think. Uh, um, uh, there are a ton of commands that are available. Um, and what makes things even more confusing is that Python has a lot of importable libraries. And when you import a library into Python, you import commands that come with it. So it's, it's kind of like, um, let's say you have a minivan and that's your only vehicle. And when you go out and say, go to the grocery store, when we're allowed to do that, um, you don't pack your skiing equipment in there. You don't pack your beach equipment. You don't pack your um, yard management tools and things like that. So when you go to the grocery store, you go, maybe you take your reusable bags. Um, you definitely take your mask and your gloves. So Python assumes that there's a minimal set of things that you would want to do. And a lot of them are available to you right now. But if you import something, so say, um, I'm going to add something here. Please don't worry about uh, what I type here. But if I do import OS and run that, 
Um, uh, I can do OS uh, list dir, I think. And so this command here, OS, see OS list dir, it tells me the contents of the folder that I'm working in. See, I have these two things that are in this here. If I change this name up here basic, to basics, say for example, and rename, it's changed the name here. And if I run this command again, it sees that the name has been changed. But this command is not available until I import this. So in, in a sense, yes, there are indexes of commands out there, but there's just so many and there's so many things associated with specific tasks that you might do that the scope is very, very large. I hope that answers your question. So we're at five minutes until three, and I'd like to pause here to see if anybody has any specific questions about the things that they, we have covered here today. Or if you have general questions or anything, I'm more than happy to take the time and even go over a little time to answer those. It's ultimately up to your availability. And Brown, so can I ask, what would be the next step now if I wrote like the code for about book capacity? I, I see it on the screen. Mm -hmm. Now, where would I like, I mean, I'm not a computer expert, but like, okay, where does it show up on a user side? Like when a word has an application and as a user side that, or like on a website, would this be running in the background so that, I guess what I'm saying is where do I, I write the code, where does it show up? Because obviously showing the code to people, I don't know. Does that make okay. sense? Uh, yeah, it does. So we can, if I can speak in a general sense, there's a number of things that we can do. So we didn't address any of the ways today other than just show output. There are ways where we could write something to a file. For example, imagine if you had, say, a folder of items that where, say, scans are being dumped. You could schedule a script that would look at the number of files that are in there, say, maybe count them, and then write that number to a separate text file, for example. We could make it so that this text right here, instead of being printed to the screen, we could write that to a text file. We could make it so that this text is put into an email and then sent automatically. We could say, like, for example, imagine if we had recipient equals, there are ways, not with what we have right here, where we could write this and it would automatically send to you. Um, we could input a list of email addresses, say that's in a text file or it's in a, um, an Excel file or something like that, where we take people's um, email addresses and such. And then based upon, like, let's say we have an email address and next to it is the number of books that they've um, installed or the number of dollars that they've donated. We could have an Excel spreadsheet that has just two columns, but from that generate 100,000 emails. We could, then, um, we could then take that text, we could schedule it so um, every time there's uh, 30 scans in a folder, we'll just, you know, it, once a day it checks and if there's 30 scans in a folder, Sean, you get an email that says there are 30 scans in this folder uh, that are ready for you to process. And so these kind of things can be done in an automated sense. They're a little outside of the scope of what we've done today. But the idea here was to think about, okay, these are some general sense type of programming techniques. Now we can start talking about specifics. And hopefully with enough interest, we'll start moving on into other things. Like one of the classes that I hope that I get an opportunity to teach is programmatically interacting with tabular data sets like Excel spreadsheets, because there are operations we do very frequently. Okay, Sarah, thank you very much for being here. There are operations that we do where all we're really doing is opening up an Excel spreadsheet, 
making some changes and then saving it. And if we do that more than once, why don't we write a script to do it automatically for us? And so then we don't have to worry about it. Um, we had a situation with uh, um, ILL where they had a, um, a file that was tabular data, but it was too big to open in Excel and they needed to do some editing on it. So we wrote a script that went through and said, if it has this value in this column, put it into this file. If it has this value in this column, put it into this other file. And file A only needs these three columns and file B needs these five columns, but they're different. So all of those things can be accomplished. Anything else today? You're having a hard time finding the Python folder on your hard drive. I believe we've talked before and you have a Mac, correctly? I correct? do. Okay. Let's uh, maybe after this session is done, um, if you have a moment, you and I can do a separate support session and work through trying to figure that out. Okay. Sound good? Yeah. Wonderful. Any other questions for anyone? Well, let me say thank you very much for being here. Um, please, uh, if you have an opportunity um, and there's some specific ideas of things that you want to try to accomplish, let us know. And if this is something that is interesting to you and you'd like to see more of these, please, uh, uh, I believe there'll be an opportunity for feedback and let us know what you'd like to see. Yes, please do fill out that assessment form, but you can also always send feedback either to me directly or in this case to me and to Brown. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.